Thank you. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for uh, being here for this talk, Make Developers Fly. Right? My name is Mahavir Tereya. I'm working as Solutions Architect with AWS. And today, I will walk you through how we can make developers fly via principle of platform engineering. And here, I literally mean uh, fly not with providing a flight ticket to the developers, where they are dependent on uh, central common aircraft or support staff, but giving them a wing. So they can fly where they want, when they want, right? Of course, by considering the guardrails of the organization. So just to set the context, uh, what we will see in this talk, so we will first uh, try to see why first place we need platform engineering. Then we'll see uh, what are the good characteristic of uh, good platforms and what it requires to do a mind mindset shift. And in the end, we say uh, also like how AWS plays a role here. I really like uh, this question, why? Because a few days back, I was just uh, scrolling my LinkedIn and somebody posted uh, one quote of Einstein, where Einstein says like, if you give him an hour to solve a problem, he will first spend 50 minutes in understanding the problem and then rest 10 in solving it. So it's very important to understand like why first place we need a platform engineering, what pain points we have, right? And, and these will automatically give us some perspective like what elements we need to optimize or what we need to solve in order to make it better. So if we uh, try to understand uh, this question, we need to understand like how do we in a traditional model build softwares and develop and deploy softwares. So generally, it happens like software developers uh, develop the software, and then in order to deploy it, throw it over the fence, and then forget about it eventually. Of course, these models uh, create a frictions, right? Because uh, it, it gets very hard to assign ownership, and also the context with the end consumer stay very far from the main developer. And this model is also uh, not generally followed at Amazon. Our CTO back 18 years back stated like, uh, you build it, you run it. That means keeping the developer very close to the business so that they understand the whole context of what they are doing. And uh, this eventually also improves the quality of their software, uh, what they are making it. So if we uh, dive deeper into this aspect and try to see uh, how the technology is evolving, uh, we realize that every other day there is a new name of some tool which can solve uh, one another problem, right? And that increases the cognitive load uh, to the developers. And just, by the way, this is not a QR code. This is a cognitive load on the developers, right? With this much of complexity, how we can solve the problem of platform engineering? And that, that's where we need to understand like, okay, uh, how platform engineering can help and what actually the platform engineering is all about. So in a nutshell or in a simplest term, uh, platform engineering is any repeatable mechanism uh, which can reduce the cognitive load of developers and at the same time improves the quality and productivity of the developers, right? And, and if this is all about product uh, or, or if this is all about platform engineering, then the obvious question comes is like how platform engineering plays a role in building a platform. This is where uh, I would like to quote uh, uh, one of the uh, tech contributor to the ThoughtWorks who spent 15 years as a tech advisor, Ivan Bocher, uh, where Ivan clearly mentions or uh, says like best pet platforms are those who consider it like a product, right? And not force user to use it, but it should be compelling and easy to use it. And that's where uh, it also comes into the line uh, with the fact like how to do it. And that beautifully defined in the team topology book, which is released by Matthew and Manuel in 2019, where they mention there are total four kind of different collaboration method or teams 
where the first one is a stream aligned teams. These are the mainly the developer team, product team, or business domain teams. And then it comes to an enabler team, who actually helps a product team or a business team and share the knowledge in between. And the third comes is a complicated subsystem. So these are the uh, teams, or I would rather call it as an advanced sub subsystems, which is like a machine learning team or a data team who provide uh, a use as a service. Yeah, And then it comes as a platform team. This is the team who actually, in the end, provide the internal product to the developers so that they can make their life easy, faster, productive. If we see uh, this picture of interaction models between these team topology, we see there are mainly three different uh, collaboration models. And of course, for, this is running from left to right, and this is a snapshot in time. So these eventually change, and that's actually a good because we also want to enforce knowledge exchange. So if we see uh, X as a service, this is morely re related to the advanced subsystem teams who build some service and which internally get consumed, right? M not generally get exposed to the end user, but enhance the productivity or enhance the capability of the product what we are building. Then it comes to a facilitating uh, collaboration model, which is mostly between the enabler teams and the product or stream aligned teams. And the third one is a collaboration, which is collaboration between the platform team and the developer team, uh, where they uh, figure it out what are the best practices to build softwares. If we combine our learning from Ivan, uh, where uh, he clearly mentions about considering the product uh, or a platform as a product and the team topology, we can summarize that the best platforms are those who actually do it. That means the be best platforms are those who actually consider the platform as a product and have a clear uh, user-centric uh, mindset. And it should also be very uh, compelling to use. So it should not be a force, but it should be uh, prepared in a way that it becomes easy to use for the developer. And, and uh, it should reduce the cognitive load eventually, because that is the main uh, element which we are trying to optimize, right? And we also will eventually see a good platforms are those who are not just talking about the technology, but also about the knowledge exchange, documentation, so and so forth. With that, uh, it, it becomes quite evident that it is a mindset shift. It is not just about uh, giving a fancy name uh, to the uh, platform, right? Uh, so it requires that we have clearly defined uh, user-centric cent mindset, the product mindset, right? And, and whatever we do should, at the end, be useful to your end user. That means to the developers. And that's how we eventually start making them fly. So now uh, we reach to the point where we need to uh, dive deeper into the aspect like what is the platform actually uh, made up of, right? So in order to see that, if we understand this map, we realize that in order to visualize a good platform, technology is actually a very small subsystem of it. And the majority part goes also into the training, consultancy, documentation, best practices, so and so forth. And that eventually automatically reflect to the best practices and the more productivity for the developers, right? And uh, this is like a very general uh, thinking behind, like whenever we hear about platform engineers or a platform engineering in general, we start thinking about a technology. We rarely think about uh, uh, mechanisms which can actually make the life easy for the developer, right? It can be a very complex system, or it can also be a single wiki page where we have defined the good best practices and maybe a, a good starting guides. But the obvious question also comes maybe in your mind is like, okay, what good platform actually looks like for me? And the answer is, it depends. So. Right? Uh, and that's what, what you hear uh, most of the time from the architects <laughs> when you ask them a complex question. OK, it depends. And, and, uh, but what it depends on? That is a smart another question, right? Uh, that's fine, like it depends, but what it depends on? And for that, 
uh, we need to check some operational models uh, which will give us an idea like in order to consider that which particular platform model is best for you we first need to understand what those models are so one of my colleague, uh, Adam, brought a paper on these. And uh, in this paper, uh, he defines there are generally four kind of operational model when it comes to a platform or a developer platform. So one is a centralized provisioning, where everything happens centrally, right? And the developers are completely dependent on the central platform engineering team. They raise a ticket when they want something new. Central team decide whether to do it or not, and then uh, then the things works. Of course, this model has a very slow feedback loop. It becomes extremely slow and bottleneck on the central team uh, before making any move. The second part comes is a platform enabled golden path. So we are improving a bit by bit when moving from left to right, uh, where central team now starts giving some templatization to the developers. So they give uh, golden paths, how to do something, how to build and develop uh, and deploy softwares. But it also still uh, dependent on the new use cases. They need to be dependent on the platform and DevOps engineers. So this still is a bottleneck. Third part comes is embedded DevOps. So we start integrating the DevOps folks with the uh, business domain teams or a developer. This model works good. But there is a problem that this is not very scalable. So you can't introduce a DevOps folks in every particular uh, developer teams, right? But then, then it comes to a de decentralized DevOps team. Here we are trying to introduce like, OK, developers take more responsibility of the DevOps, and we make them 360 degree capable so that they can develop and deploy softwares whenever they want wherever they want, of course, by keeping the guardrails and boundary in mind. There is still one challenge that we make in this model, the developers so much so independent that for the central team, it becomes like a black box, what exactly they are doing in the end. And that's where uh, the topic comes, is a decentralized developer platform, where we want to introduce more collaboration between the centralized uh, platform team and the developers so that developers can also contribute in building those uh, capabilities. And if we dive deeper into this part, we can clearly see like how that model looks like is, uh, sorry for the slide. So how that model looks like is that we want to introduce more extra collaboration effort between them. So in the end, uh, what happens is that these developer can also contribute to the in, uh, inner source code of the platform engineers, what, whatever the templates they are building on. With that, uh, we need to learn like, OK, what are the basic principles in, in order to build such kind of platform? So we uh, made it easy to remember abbreviation called VDUCTS. What these VDUCs is all about for the principle of good platform? So it starts with version. No brainer, right? It's very simple, like because the developer should be at any point of time should be able to go back, right? Same like uh, how Go made in the morning. If if you guys were there in the first talk, Go made a promise that it will be always uh, uh, compilable no matter what versions changes, right? The same way it should be version. It should be decentralized. That means uh, we also want to reduce the blast radius. At the same time, it should be uh, a, 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 every and any team should be able to build and run it. The third part is user centric. So this is from again from the Evans definition that we want to consider our platform as a product, and for that we need to keep our users in mind always. And uh, that also makes it like internal marketing. That means uh, doing it in a way that where we don't force them, but give them a choice or build it in a way or make it easy in a way so that it becomes obvious to use it. And of course, the important part is also inner source, uh, where the developers in the end also should be able to contribute to the platform, not just being dependent on the platform. 
The fourth part is customizable. So uh, when we say con uh, contribute, that means we need to make them uh, unable to do that, right? So we should not give them very hard templates, which is not changeable at all, but it should be para parameterized. And at, uh, at the end, it also should have a capacity to change. It should be transparent. This is, uh, again, going back to the previous uh, uh, topic, which we discussed, that pla good platforms are not just about the technology. It's also about the knowledge exchange. So, and it's also about uh, what kind of a starting guide it has. And it should be a self-serve. So less dependency on the central team, and it should be able uh, to create an environment whenever they want, right? And, and no tickets uh, for the platform guys where they become dependent. So if you are, if you are uh, more into these, and if you really like uh, this decentralized developer platform, then my colleague Robert Hoffman also wrote a paper about that, which you can fi find in IX and CT uh, generals. But these, these, when we talk about this, this becomes uh, or looks very easy. But when we want to build such a uh, abstraction layer in reality, so the folks who are actually working with the platform knows that it's very complicated stuff. And now we are jumping into the uh, part like how cloud can help us. Before we move there, uh, this is also a very important aspect which I would like to mention that our business differentiator is not just a technology. So your end user wouldn't care how good platform engineering team you have or what complex stuff you are doing. They care about the user experience. They care about, are you able to handle their scale? Are you able to handle their experience, right? And that's where uh, if we uh, go dive deeper into that, if we see that platform engineering today is, we generally take some uh, bare metal services of the cloud and then start building the capabilities like service backup, patching, installation, documentation, uh, stuff by our own. And that's what we call a platform engineering. But with time, this definition is no longer uh, valid. Because now, with the introduction of more advanced capabilities like Gen AI or product management into the platforms, the responsibility starts getting increased. And that's where uh, the, we need to invest the time on those places where we can actually make a business differentiator and make our developers uh, so that they can create insight faster, so that they can make their product to market faster. And the idea is like going more towards managed services where actually it is not your main business differentiator and start using more managed services and actually focusing on those business differentiator where actually it matters. And now, uh, if we dive deeper into the implementation part, like uh, what it takes while implementing such a developer platform, we see that this year uh, CNCF released a white paper on this, and that's where uh, they also clearly uh, uh, mention, uh, or, or in a way they say like, okay, th the good platforms are actually a product, and it has a two main elements to it. One is a platform interface, and the second is a platform capability. It looks a cumbersome, and the idea is not to dive deeper into this white paper, but if you look closely, they also say uh, mapping of different capabilities with different CNCF projects, right? If we move towards uh, AWS view uh, to these different capabilities, we see the, uh, the list of different services which we can map to the different capabilities of the platform engineering. I'll not dive deeper into all of these, but I would really like to take a time in uh, walking you through a bit on the Proton, uh, which is our deployment service. And I would like to say like how Proton can help in building good platforms. If you look at the Proton service, uh, which is, as I mentioned, it is a deployment service by AWS, it has a main two element. One is an environment template, and the second is a service template. So generally what happens is that uh, administrator or a platform uh, team creates different environment templates so that you can make a different environment like staging prod or dev. And then out of, uh, once these environment templates are deployed, 
the team creates a service template, and these uh, service template being used by the developers, and also they be able to contribute to that, right? Uh, that you can easily find it into, into the product cat uh, catalog of a platform in the management console. Going back to the main principles, uh, which we define in the beginning, uh, how these capability can map. So if you see here, the d environment templates can be versioned uh, on, in, in Proton as a service, and uh, it is a decentralized. So we are talking about a different environment templates for different uh, uh, accounts. And then uh, we see like, OK, uh, the developers can easily use these templates. So it is a self-serve. They don't no longer need to be dependent on the platform team. And it is also customizable. So they can also contribute to these service template. These, these service templates can stay in a Git, uh, like an inner source, uh, right? And, and they can create a pull request, and they can contribute to the changes. And of course, it is a transparent and the user-centered. So with these, we define that how Proton can help us in defining those V ducts principle of platform engineering in order to build a, a developer platform or a developer experience better. With that, uh, I thank you all of you for being present today.